uh, introduce uh, Stephen Gowans. Thank you, Brandon. It gives me great pleasure, I'm quite delighted, uh, to introduce uh, Sir Stephen Gowan. Uh, he is a foreign uh, policy analyst uh, based in Ottawa, but he's not your ordinary uh, foreign policy analyst. Most of them are now cheerleaders for power or parrot uh, the establishment. Uh, Stephen Gowan uh, is unique in taking a perspective of an informed citizen and being able to criticize and to debunk most of the narratives that have been advanced to justify uh, war and uh, sustaining the flames of the war in Syria. Uh, the Syrian war is not your ordinary war either, and it's not a civil war, it's not a, an uprising, it's not a group of Democrats who are facing and uh, uh, contending for power against a dictator. It's literally the fault line of the Third World War. Uh, in a very small area, you have the Russians and the Americans, at the, literally loggerhead, and anything can go wrong. And what seems to be here, and we keep hearing it, and now, unfortunately, our Prime Minister is joining the chorus for regime change. Nobody had invited him to the party. I don't know why he would really put Canada right into harm's way in an area that is so difficult and so challenging. Uh, Mr. Sir Gowan is a prolific writer. Uh, he has uh, a blog in What's Left, uh, and he has dealt with some of the most complicated areas and subjects. Uh, let me just uh, take a couple of them. Uh, the good liberation hero against the bad liberation hero. Uh, hushing up and uh, profiting from Saudi aggressions. And the story here is the gross hypocrisy of the West standing up with a very uh, backward, archaic regime that is wreaking havoc on the poorest of the, of the, of the region. Uh, he has also uh, brought, and the most recent one uh, is uh, something that is so relevant to what we're having here is about the uh, Syrian war. And he has continuously contributed, not just the fantastic book that uh, he is signing over there, which is Washington's war against Syria. Uh, his, his continuous writing, Washington considers military action against North Korea to force regime change. It seems like uh, they're jumping from one area to the other. Uh, what we're having here is a very serious and a very challenging situation. And the perspective that Mr. Stephen Gohan uh, gives you is one uh, that is refreshing and uh, not your run of the men, because he literally is going to give you the one uh, that would not succumb and would not present uh, from the perspective of world corporations and multinationals and Western governments, but one the ordinary informed citizen. Uh, with further ado, uh, further ado, I welcome Sir Stephen Gohan to have it. Thank you. excuses in advance. My glasses fall, fell apart today, so I had to quickly arrange to get new glasses. And my prescription was changed, so I was told, well, you know, it's going to take you two weeks to accommodate. So I find myself with quite a headache at the moment. Um, anyway, I offer that as an excuse for my poor performance if my performance is poor. So, this book I should emphasize this. This book is a book about U.S. foreign policy. Okay, That's the principal reason this was written. It's an examination of U.S. foreign policy. So let me, um, can you hear me all right? Yeah. I don't, a little okay. closer. A little closer? There you go. All right, now I can't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> what I'll do is I'll summarize the book for you in about 30 seconds. And then I'll um, elaborate on some of the themes in the book. And then I'll take you through a more detailed look at Washington's long war on Syria, the actual war rather than the book. So let me start with the central idea. 
<clears throat> the central idea of this book is that the wealthy have, and this is not an unusual idea, others, I mean, it's hardly unique to me, but wealth, the wealthy have an inordinate influence on the formation of public policy in the United States, including foreign policy, most especially foreign policy. Um, U.S. foreign policy is structured to promote and defend the interests of billionaire investors and shareholders of U.S. banks and corporations. Washington would like the land, the labor, the resources, the markets of the Arab and Muslim world to be used for the benefit of U.S. bankers, U.S. shareholders of large corporations. By contrast, Syria, under the leadership of Bashar al-Assad, the current president, and before him, his father, the previous president, Hafez al-Assad, wanted the land, labor, resources, and markets of Syria and the larger Arab world to be used for the uplift of Syrians and for the uplift of Arabs. So there is therefore a fundamental contradiction between U.S. foreign policy and the Syrian government. They seek antagonistic goals. This contradiction has been present since at least 1963. 1963 is when the Arab nationalists came to power in Syria. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and the United States has sought to resolve that contradiction in its favor for at least the last six decades. Hence the title of the book, Washington's Long War on Syria. A more fitting title may have been Wall Street's Long War on Syria, <laughs> which indeed was the working title, and it's the title I wanted, but apparently publishers have some influence over matters like this, so it became Washington's Long War on Syria. Um, some people, including those uh, who write reviews in Quill Inquire, uh, which reviewed this book recently, um, and others who are enamored of the work of Noam Chomsky say that this view is far too simple. That the conflict in Syria is much more complicated than that. Uh, but they usually stop there without explaining why they think that view is too simple. Well, let's hear the words of the great docent of the left, Noam Chomsky. What would he say? Um, Chomsky writes in Towards a New Cold War that to understand imperialist wars or interventionist wars, quote, it is a good idea to begin by investigating the domestic social structure. Who sets foreign policy? What interests do these people represent? What is the domestic source of their power? This is precisely the questions that this book addresses. Um, and the book is organized or has various sub-themes organized in chapters. So let me take you through what those sub-themes are. The first chapter is titled The Den of Arabism, um, which is a, I really like that phrase, the den of Arabism, it's not my phrase. Uh, and this first chapter is an examination of Arab nationalist ideology, which underlines or underlies the actions of the Syrian state and places it in conflict with the interests of Wall Street. That ideology and its hostility to the idea that Washington can and will lead a global order, a global economic order, a global political order, that ideology is best summed up by two phrases, one which comes from the Syrian constitution, the other which comes from the Syrian president. So let me tell you about the phrase that comes from the Syria's constitution. Syria's constitution defines the Syrian state as the beating heart of Arabism and the forefront of confrontation with the Zionist enemy <coughs> and the bedrock of resistance against colonial hegemony in the Arab world. <coughs> Syria's president Bashar al-Assad has said, quote, Syria is an independent state working for the interests of its people rather than making the Syrian people work for the interests of the United States. I said that the United States wants to lead a global economic order. That's not 
a motivation that I've attributed to Washington. In fact, Washington is quite open about this ambition. The phrase, the United States can and will lead a global order, comes directly from the United States 2015 National Security Strategy. It is a fascinating document, and it's readily available on the internet, and I'd recommend that all of you read it if you can. Um, read it because it's so astonishing. Astonishing because it's a national security document, so you'd expect that it would be about national security. Almost all of it is about economics. Almost all of it is about how to structure the planet economically. And in that national security document, the United States says unabashedly that it can and will lead the world. That it's never a question of whether the United States will lead. That the United States is the world's indispensable power. That it has primacy. That it has a leadership role. Um, that sounds nice when you put it that way. It has a leadership role. It's the, it has primacy. The Italian philosopher Domenico Lucerto describes this in a, another way. It says the United States pursues, or there is an international dictatorship of the United States, which is another way of talking about primacy and leading the world. The second chapter of this book is titled Regime Change. Um, and it is an examination of two forces which have worked to bring about regime change in Damascus since the middle 1950s. They've worked sometimes separately, sometimes together. The first force is the United States government under the sway of the US business owning class. And the second force is the Muslim Brotherhood, the ideological antecedent of Al Qaeda and ISIS. Um, I should hasten to add that it's also the ideological antecedent of more moderate groups, Islamic groups. Um, in Syria, the Muslim Brotherhood is committed to violence as a means of bringing about political change. The Muslim Brotherhood in some other countries is not committed to violence. It's committed to participating in elections. Why the difference? Um, well, the Muslim Brotherhood's committed to violence in Syria. One of the reasons why is because the Syrian constitution bans political parties based on religion. That means that the Muslim Brotherhood has little recourse but to seek political change through extra constitutional means and through violence. However, I'll talk later about why it is that there is a prohibition in Syria against political parties based on religion. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria has worked since the early 1960s to topple the government in Damascus in order to replace it with a Sunni Islamic state. Both the US government and the Muslim Brothers have worked together on efforts of regime change. Chapter 3. Chapter 3 is titled The 2011 Distemper. This is a look at whether the uprising, which broke out in 2011, mid-March 2011, whether it was a secular democratic revolt against dictatorship and neoliberalism, as some people argue. And I'll discuss that in more detail in a few moments. Chapter 4 is titled The Myth of the Moderate Rebel. Uh, and it is an examination of who the insurgents are. Uh, the insurgents that the U.S. government labels as moderates and what their relationship is to the non-moderate rebels, especially Al-Qaeda. Moderate rebels were defined, the interesting thing about the, the phrase moderate is that moderate is used to connote rather than denote. It's used to suggest something. Moderation is something good. There was never this was a, a, a deliberately constructed phrase of deception. Um, and we know that because if you ever read press reports about the moderate rebels, it might have occurred to you to ask, what is meant by moderate anyway? I know what they want me to think. Moderate, that sounds like pacific, you know, uh, inclined to discussion, perhaps pluralistic. 
Um, but what was really meant? <clears throat> well, what was really meant was finally revealed by then head of U.S. intelligence, James Clapper, who was talking to the Council on Foreign Relations. The Council on Foreign Relations is kind of a lobby group on behalf of Wall Street. And he said, well, moderate rebels, the moderate rebels are any rebels other than ISIS. That's the definition of moderate. Anyone other than ISIS, irrespective of their orientation toward democracy, irrespective of the methods they use, irrespective of their goals or their ideology. They're simply called moderate, simply because they were not ISIS. The moderate rebels, in fact, in the main, are Islamists, whose goal is not democracy, but a Sunni Islamic state. They are, in the main, insurgents who use terrorist methods. Not exclusively. They also use other methods of guerrilla warfare, but they also use terrorist methods. And they cooperate on the battlefield with Al-Qaeda. They are enmeshed with Al-Qaeda. They work under license to Al-Qaeda. They are auxiliaries of Al-Qaeda. And they pass their US supplied weapons to Al-Qaeda. Um, it's fascinating. You don't see it much anymore, but the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Washington Post would talk about US trained rebels. And they used all kinds of phrases to describe the relationship of those rebels to Al-Qaeda. They said they were enmeshed with them, they were entangled with them, they were cooperating on the battlefield with them, they were sharing weapons with them. <clears throat> Essentially, they were Al-Qaeda, but they're Al-Qaeda under another name. The name was U.S. Supplied and Trained Moderate Rebels. Chapter 5 is titled, The Ba'athist Islamic Ally. The Ba'athists are the Arab nationalists. Um, the Ba'ath Arab Socialist Party, and I emphasize socialist because that's part of the explanation for why Free Enterprise Washington is opposed to the Ba'ath Arab Socialists. And there may be some who are raising their eyes and saying, yeah, they might call themselves socialists, but are they really socialists? So, I mean, what is socialism? You can define it in many ways. But the significant question is, does the United States regard them as socialists? And is that, is that one of the reasons why the U.S. government is hostile to the Ba'ath Arab Socialist <laughs> Government of Damascus? And I believe very much it is. Um, and it's, there's no question that the United States regards the government in, in Damascus as a socialist government. You can read U.S. State Department documents in which complaints are made about the socialist orientation of the government in Damascus. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. The Ba'ath Arab Socialist Party um, is the party to which Bashar al-Assad belongs. It's also the party to which Saddam of Iraq belonged. The party has three major goals. Unity of the Arab world, so overcoming its religious and other differences, including laying to rest the antagonism between Sunni and Shia. Freedom from foreign domination, that's its second goal, and socialism. Socialism defined as public ownership of the commanding heights of the economy and a significant role for government in the guidance of the economy. The Arab nationalist values of unity, freedom, and socialism also inspired Muammar Gaddafi and were explicitly referred to in the constitution, the first constitution that Gaddafi had uh, written. Uh, Gaddafi was greatly impressed by the great Arab nationalist leader, the Egyptian Gamal Abdel Nasser, whose lieutenant he aspired to become. Um, and if you read his constitution, Gaddafi's constitution, which he originally wrote, you'll see explicit references to unity, freedom, socialism. If you read the Syrian constitutions, the one that was written in 2012, the one written by Hafez al-Assad, the current president's father, in 1973, you'll see references to unity, freedom, socialism. 
If you read the constitution that was prepared for Iraq by Saddam, you'll also see references to unity, freedom, socialism. These values are also implicitly present in the constitution of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And it is the Islamic Republic of Iran, which is the Ba'athist Islamic ally referred to in the chapter title. Now, the political Islam of Iran is non-sectarian. It seeks the unity of the Muslim world and the bridging of differences between Shia and Sunni. Uh, it also seeks the freedom of the Muslim world from foreign domination. And it favors an economic model which is largely indistinguishable from the economic model favored by Arab nationalists, uh, namely a model of economic planning and public ownership of the commanding heights of the economy. So many people wonder, you know, why are Iran and Syria allies? Well, they're allies because they want the same things for the most part. But they say, you know, uh, Syria is secular. Iran is Islamic. So how is it that they could be allies, especially since secular Syria is entangled in a war with Islamists? Well, the Iranians want to overcome sectarian differences in the Muslim world. And the Arab nationalists want to overcome sectarian differences in the <coughs> Arab part of the Muslim world. The Iranians want to liberate the Muslim world from foreign domination. The Arab nationalists want to liberate the Arab part of the Muslim world from foreign domination. The Iranians favor a significant role for the state in the economy, and the Arab nationalists favor a significant role for the state in the economy. Those are significant reasons why Iran and Syria are allies, despite the fact that one government is secular and the other government is Islamist. Chapter 6 is titled Washington State Islamic Allies as opposed to its non-state Islamic allies like Al-Qaeda, for example, or the so-called moderate rebels, most of whom are Islamists. Um, and this is a look at the Islamic countries that are allies of the United States. So if the Islamic State of Iran is an ally of Arab nationalist Syria because they share a commitment to unity, and a commitment to freedom from foreign domination, and a commitment to socialism, then you might expect that the Islamic allies of Washington would share a commitment to disunity in the Arab and Muslim worlds, a commitment to US hegemony over the Arab and Muslim worlds, and a commitment to free enterprise. And indeed, that would be the case. Uh, Washington's principal Islamic State ally, Saudi Arabia, promotes a very divisive brand of Islam, which operates against the efforts of Arab nationalists and the Islamic Republic of Iran to overcome the sectarian differences which divide the Arab and Muslim world. The Saudi monarchy is also highly integrated into the US financial elite and depends on the United States for protection against the Saudi population, which is hostile to the monarchy. Chapter 7 uh, is called Divide et Impera, or Latin for divide and rule. I'm not sure why I said Divide et Impera. Maybe I felt Latin that day. Um, and Chapter 8, Echoes of Hitler. Look at the efforts of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, the Muslim Brothers ally, Washington, and Washington's ally, Saudi Arabia, to divide the Arab world on religious grounds. Chapter 7 looks at how the United States restructured Iraq's political system in order to bring sectarian cleavages to the fore. In this time-honored imperialist you know, tradition of divide and rule, uh, Chapter 8 looks at efforts to paint Arab nationalists in Damascus who seek to bridge the Arab world's religious and other differences, but seek to describe them as an Alawi regime, uh, using Arab nationalism as a cover to pursue a sectarian agenda. You don't see that much anymore, but say in 2016, 2015, there was a lot of writing in the press which would suggest that 
as they called it, the Assad regime was an Alawi regime, which was attempting to pursue some kind of sectarian agenda in, in uh, Syria. This, in my view, is kind of an echo of Hitler, who presented communism as a cover for Jews to pursue a religious agenda of dominating Europe's Christian majority. And hence, we have the idea of the Judeo-Bolshevism in which Hitler and others conflated Judaism and communism. Well, likewise, there's been this conflation of the Alawi sect with Arab nationalism. It certainly comes from the Muslim Brotherhood to suggest that secular Arab nationalism is simply a cover for the Alawis to pursue their sectarian agenda. Chapter 9 is titled Wall Street's Empire, and it answers the question Chomsky posed as essential to understanding U.S. foreign policy. Who sets U.S. foreign policy? What interests do these people represent? What is the domestic source of their power? So, let me just step you through an historical timeline of the conflict in Syria. So this will be a look at the Long War. In the mid-1950s, Washington conspired with London to purge Arab nationalist influence from Syria. Their target was a triumvirate of Arab nationalist and communist leaders who Washington and London perceived as threatening economic interests in the Middle East. Spearheading the effort was Kermit Roosevelt of the infamous Roosevelt family, which gave us two U.S. presidents. Kermit himself was infamous. Uh, you may know him as the man who engineered the overthrow of Iran's Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh, who committed the grave crime against Western domination of nationalizing Iran's oil industry. Roosevelt and British intelligence uh, MI6 planned to enlist the help of the Muslim Brothers to overthrow the three men in Damascus they saw as threatening Western economic interests. In the 1960s, the Muslim Brothers led protests, strikes, demonstrations, riots in Syria under the banner Islam or Ba'ath, by which they meant Islam or secularism, always in opposition to what the governments called the or rather what the brothers called the government's godless character. In 1967, the Brotherhood declared a holy war against secular nationalists, denouncing them as infidels and enemies of God. In the 1970s, the Brotherhood established an underground paramilitary organization anticipating the so-called rebels of today. The 1970s rebels were armed and trained outside of Syria, uh, just as today's rebels are armed and trained out of sight of Syria by U.S. and Western intelligence services in Qatar and Jordan. Um, the brothers launched a major campaign of urban guerrilla warfare, assassinating Ba'ath Arab socialists, murdering state officials, killing army officers, attacking Syrian government buildings, assaulting Syrian military installations. In 1973, Hafez al-Assad, the current president's father, oversaw the drafting of a constitution for Syria that promulgated a mission for his country. And the mission would be to foster the unity of the Arab world, to overcome its religious, sectarian, other differences, uh, in order to achieve the Arab world's liberation from foreign domination and to modernize and indigenize the economy. Modernization and indigenization of the economy would be planned. This was written into the Constitution by uh, economic planning and public ownership, what Washington would denounce as socialism. Indeed, in Washington, Assad was denounced as an Arab communist. He wasn't a communist. In fact, he was suspicious of communists, and communists were suspicious of him. But from Washington's perspective, he may as well have been a communist because the policies he implemented had effects on corporate America equal to the effects of policies that communists would have implemented. In the 1980s, Robert Baer, a CIA officer who served in the Middle East for three decades, found that Syria was, quote, the epicenter of Islamic terrorism. Baer wrote, when I first set foot in Damascus in 1980, I estimated that Assad had maybe three or four years before he went under. 
Um, the Muslim Brothers owned the street. The mosque schools were teaching jihad. The mosque public address system layered out a message of hate and revenge. I figured this guy's going to get strung up on a light pole in downtown Damascus along with a whole lot of other Syrians. In the 1980s, the brothers established an Islamic front for Syria, whose manifesto declared a war without end until Ba'ath Arab socialism was exterminated in Syria. In 1982, the Muslim Brothers seized control of Hama, Syria's fourth largest city. They went on a blood-soaked rampage. They attacked police stations. They murdered any Ba'ath Arab socialist they could find. They executed government officials. They killed soldiers. Every Ba'ath Arab Socialist Party official in the city was executed, many by decapitation. In the Syrian government operation to quell the uprising, the Syrian Arab army captured more than 15,000 foreign supplied machine guns, along with prisoners, including Jordanian and CIA trained paramilitaries. Likewise, insurgents operating in Syria today have been trained by the CIA and other Western intelligence services in Qatar and, and Jordan, as I mentioned. In the 1990s, the Muslim Brotherhood established an alliance with other sectarian or Sunni sectarian, sectarian Sunni political Islamists to form what became known as the National Front for the Salvation of Syria but perhaps was more aptly called the National Front for the Salvation of Syria from secularism. Uh, the front had two goals. Its most pressing and immediate goal was the assassination of Assad. Its longer fundamental goal was to establish a political or an Islamic state in Syria based on the Quran. Let's jump to 2001. The aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, the retired U.S. Army General uh, Wesley Clark told a reporter that during a trip to the Pentagon, he learned of plans the Pentagon had developed to attack a number of countries in the Arab and Muslim worlds. One was Iraq, which was soon attacked. Another was Libya, which was eventually attacked. And a third was Syria. In 2002, Syria was added to the Bush administration's Axis of Evil hit list, its, uh, its regime hit list. Uh, Washington claimed that Syria was developing weapons of mass destruction and sponsoring terrorism. This was the same bogus charge it had leveled against Iraq as a pretext to topple the Arab nationalist government in Baghdad to privatize an Iraqi economy which Washington denounced as socialist and was indeed to a large degree publicly owned and planned. Um, Iraq had combined its oil wealth with public ownership and planning of the economy to produce what one former U.S. State Department official had called the golden age. He wrote, schools, universities, hospitals, factories, theaters, museums proliferated Employment became so universal that a labor shortage developed. The same former U.S. State Department official wrote about Gaddafi in Libya, that by combining Libya's oil wealth with public ownership and planning of the economy, Gaddafi had enabled Libyans to, quote, live beyond the dreams of their fathers and grandfathers. In 2003, this is not widely known, but it is certainly not concealed on the public record. But in 2003, following the US-British invasion of, of Iraq, the United States contemplated extending military operations in Iraq to Syria, but decided that its hands were filled with the pacification of Afghanistan and the difficulties it was encountering in the resistance in Iraq, and that it would have to achieve its regime change goals for Syria by other means. The first alternative to direct military intervention was to impose broad-ranging sanctions on Syria to do what sanctions are always intended to do, destroy economies. Destroy economies in order to make life so miserable for ordinary people that they rise up and overthrow their government. In a country as large as the United States, which has such an enormous impact on the global economy, is able to destroy the economies of small countries like Syria. 
Sanctions are also useful for propaganda purposes, because once you've destroyed a country's economy, you can attribute its economic difficulties to its failure to follow your economic policy prescriptions. To say, if you had adopted free trade, free markets, free enterprise, you would have been a prosperous economy, but you didn't do so. That's why your economy is suffering, of course, without mentioning the devastating impacts of sanctions. The sanctions, as intended, devastated Syria. In October 2011, the New York Times reported that the Syrian economy, quote, was buckling under the pressure of sanctions by the West. By the spring of 2012, sanctions-induced financial hemorrhaging had, quote, forced Syrian officials to stop providing education, health care, and other essential services in some parts of Syria. By 2016, according to a leaked internal UN report, US and EU sanctions on Syria were causing huge suffering among ordinary people and preventing the delivery of humanitarian aid. The veteran foreign affairs correspondent Patrick Coburn, who writes for The Independent, likened the sanctions imposed on Syria to sanctions that had been imposed on Iraq from the early 1990s to 2003. Those sanctions, according to a UN estimate, had led to the death through malnutrition and disease of at least 500,000 children. More deaths that had been, than had been produced by all the weapons of mass destruction in history. As a result, two political scientists, John and Carl Mueller, had called the sanctions sanctions of mass destruction, uh, more devastating than the atomic bombs that had been dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, more devastating than all the mustard gas used in the First World War. In effect, the United <coughs> States had taken measures equivalent to dropping two atomic bombs on Iraq. Largely unrecognized is that sanctions of this caliber have been destroying Syria for the last 14 years. You know, we see attacks carried out by Washington's proxy guerrilla armies. We see the beheadings, we see the eviscerations, we see the barbecuing of heads, we see the suicide bombings, but what we don't see are the invisible but equally if not more destructive effects of sanctions. Significantly, the moment sanctions were lifted on a defeated Arab nationalist Iraq in 2003, they were immediately imposed on an unbowed Arab nationalist Syria, which means that from the early 1990s to 2017, for the last quarter century, the United States and its allies have waged a highly destructive campaign of economic warfare, the commercial equivalent of a nuclear attack, first on Iraq, subsequently on Syria, and why? Why have they done this? Because they're opposed to the Arab nationalist efforts to bring the economies of the Arab world under the control of people who live and work in the Arab world. Well, sanctions constituted the first means by which regime change was to be brought about. The second was to ignite or reignite the Islamist war on the Syrian state. The Islamist war that had been more or less quelled by 1982. But in 2006, Syria's Muslim Brotherhood had at least two meetings at the White House, according to the Wall Street Journal. In 2007, the Muslim Brotherhood helped found the National Salvation Front. The front met frequently with the U.S. State Department, with the National Security Council, as well as with the U.S. government-funded uh, Middle East Partnership Initiative. In late 2010, just a few months, in fact, December 2010, just a few months before riots were to erupt in the Syrian city of Dara, marking the beginning of what would become known as the Arab Spring in Syria, the Muslim Brotherhood voiced its hope for a civil revolt to oust Assad's so-called heretical government. Well, the hope that a civil revolt would soon erupt was realized only a few short months later, an outcome that the United States and Muslim Brotherhood had been working on since 2006. But in early 2011, before the uprising in Dara, 
as upheaval swept across the Arab world, all was quiet in Syria. And this perplexed Western news organizations. I mean, there were demonstrations in Tunisia. There were demonstrations in Egypt. There was an uprising in Libya, but not the slightest evidence of distemper in Syria. So the New York Times and Time Magazine dispatched reporters to find out what made Syria different. And here's what they reported. They said, all was quiet in Syria because the government had broad support. They said, all was quiet in Syria because even critics concede that Assad is popular. They said, all is quiet in Syria because Assad has, and this is Time Magazine, has endeared himself to the population, especially youth, the segment of the population from which rebellion was expected to spring, if indeed rebellion materialized. They said, all is quiet in Syria because attempts to organize protests against the government had failed. Syrians, they said, felt no compulsion to protest against their government. And you can confirm all of this yourself. It's quite easy to do. Just go to the Internet Archives of the New York Times or Time Magazine for the months January, February, March, and April 2011 and read the stories on Syria. Well, in mid-March 2011, riots broke out in Dara. They were violent. Some rioters carried arms. Buildings were burned. Vehicles were set fire to on the street. Even U.S. officials, according to the New York Times, quote, acknowledged that the demonstrations weren't peaceful and that some protesters were armed. In the mythology that would later develop about the origins of the post-2011 or post-2010 conflict, this became the protests were largely peaceful, which I guess is another way of saying they're violent, but a way of putting it so it seems like they're peaceful. Eventually, the modifier largely was dropped altogether, so that the story became the demonstrations were peaceful. And you can hear many people tell you today, with great certitude, that the demonstrations were peaceful, without offering the slightest evidence to, to show how it is that, that these were peaceful. Um, a week after the outbreak of violence in Dara, Time reported that there do not appear to be widespread calls for the fall of the regime or the removal of the relatively popular president. Well, that clashes with the narrative, the mythology that would be subsequently developed. Over a month after the outbreak of violence and rioting in Dara, the New York Times' Anthony Shadid would report, quote, the protests fall short of popular upheaval of revolutions in Egypt and Tunisia. Significantly, Time magazine would report that Islam was playing a significant role in the protests. So, if you look back over the long war on Syria, what do you have? You have civil disturbances fomented by Islamists dating to the 1960s. You have an Islamist guerrilla warfare, or guerrilla war, dating to the 1970s, culminating in the violent takeover of Hama in 1982. You have Islamists meeting with the White House, with the State Department, with the National Security Council from 2006, after Washington decides or abandons plans for direct military intervention in Syria. And we have Islam, according to Time magazine, playing a prominent role in the protests, which are violent and involve arms. Consistent with this, in 2012, the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency, one of a number of intelligence agencies in the U.S. intelligence community um, reveals that the insurgency is Islamist and led by the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda in Iraq, the forerunner of ISIS. So you have indication after indication that the uprising was not a peaceful, secular movement for democracy, but a renewal of Syria's decades-long civil war between Islamists and secularists egged on by the United States and U.S. allies. Indeed, the Defense Intelligence Agency said that the insurgents were supported by the West, that they were supported by the West's allies in the Gulf and by Turkey. Um, there are a number of other reasons to conclude that the uprising had nothing whatever to do with the pursuit of a secular liberal democracy. 
Uh, first, the Swedish Institute of International Affairs had observed that virtually all the members of the various armed insurgents groups are Sunni Arabs. The fighting has largely been restricted to Sunni Arab areas, whereas areas inhabited by Alawis, Druze, and Christians are passive or supportive of the government. Defections from the state are almost 100% Sunni. Money, arms, and volunteers pour in from the Islamic states or from pro-Islamic organizations. And this is the institute. Religion is the insurgent movement's most important common denominator. So if this rebellion was guided by secular, liberal, democratic goals, why are Alawis, Druze, and Christians not participating? Second, the Assad government amended the country's constitution in response to the uprising to allow multi-candidate presidential elections. It also suspended the security law, which is the Syrian equivalent of our War Measures Act. The security law had been invoked for a number of reasons, not least of which is that Syria remains officially at war with Israel, and Israel illegally occupies Syrian territory on the Golan Heights. These concessions I mean, in the direction of liberal democracy were immediately rejected by the insurgents and by their supporters. Instead, the insurgency heated up, despite the fact that Syria now more closely approximated the paradigm of multi-candidate or multi-party representative democracy favored by the West than any, virtually any other Arab country, and certainly more so than the <coughs> allies or the Arab allies of the United States, which are all military and royal dictatorships. Third point, this is a tart observation made by Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, national security advisor. Uh, he said, you know, we started helping the rebels, whoever they are, and they're certainly not fighting for democracy, given their sponsorship, Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Well, he might have added, they're certainly not fighting for democracy, given that their main sponsor is the United States, which promotes not democracy, but U.S. business interests. The late uh, Middle East specialist Patrick Seal wrote that the Syrian uprising should be seen as only the latest, if by far the most violent, episode in a long war between Islamists and Ba'athists, which dates back to the founding of the secular Ba'ath Arab Socialist Party in the 1940s. It's not inspired by liberal democratic goals. I mean, it's inspired on the part of the insurgents by Islamic goals, the sectarian goals, and on the part of the United States by neo-colonial goals. At the same time, the veteran foreign affairs correspondent Patrick Coburn wrote not too long ago that Washington has always wanted to get rid of Assad, not since 2011 when Obama told uh, Assad that he needed to step down, from 2000 when Assad became president, just as Washington has always wanted to get rid of his father, who they viewed as an Arab communist. Um, so, you know, the United States and sectarian Sunni political Islam formed an alliance of convenience to eliminate a common enemy from the Syrian state. But it should be emphasized, the enemy is not Assad. It's not Assad alone. I mean, the standard operating procedure of U.S. campaigns of regime change is to reduce governments Washington abhors to a single individual who can be demonized as a Hitler or branded a brutal dictator or an animal as Trump calls Assad, or a moral disgrace, as Noam Chomsky calls Assad, and so on. But the enemy is not the individual. If Assad were to step down today and leave in his place a successor who also espoused Arab nationalist values, the war would continue. Indeed, when the Ba'ath Arab socialist Saddam was driven from power in Iraq, the military dictator Washington installed in Iraq, initially, Paul L. Bremer, what was his act number one? Act number one was debathification of the state. That is, removing from the Iraqi state every secular Arab nationalist. Uh, Washington then effectively imposed the constitution on Iraq, which bars forever secular Arab nationalists from holding places in the 
Iraqi government or Iraqi state. So the objective of Washington's long war in Iraq was the debathification of the Iraqi state. The objective of Washington's long war in Syria is the debathification of the Syrian state. So let me close on this. So a year after, Muammar Gaddafi, inspired by the Arab nationalist goals of unity, freedom, and socialism, was removed from power by Islamists, backed by NATO. The Wall Street Journal revealed, and this always happens, it seems, you know, about a year after some event, you can read in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times what was really going on. The Wall Street Journal revealed that Western companies had, or oil companies had agitated for Gaddafi's removal because he was driving hard bargains with Western oil companies and insisting, he was insisting that Libyans benefit from their own oil resources. The State Department complained that this was resource nationalism. Well, you know, U.S. oil companies believe that the petroleum resources of the Arab and Muslim world should be used for the enrichment of their shareholders. But there's a systemic reason for that. They're supposed to behave that way. Um, in their view, the shareholders come first. These resources aren't to be used for the benefit of people who live in the region. Gaddafi had the very opposite view, and as a result, he was eliminated. So, a day before this book went to press, I read a short essay by a notable Canadian, Norman Bethune. The essay was titled Wounds. Uh, Bethune, for those of you who don't know, and not everyone knows who Bethune was, was a skilled and innovative surgeon who was at the forefront of the struggle for public health care in Canada. But he's perhaps best known for participating in two wars in the late 1930s. The first was the Spanish Civil War, the second was the Second Sino-Japanese War. Um, in the Second Sino-Japanese War, Bethune joined Mao's forces as a frontline surgeon in the resistance against Japanese efforts to colonize China. It was in China that Bethune wrote his essay. And his essay was a meditation on the causes of war in which he was entangled, which produced the wounds that he was called upon every day to operate on. And as I read the essay, it struck me that what Bethune was saying in a very few words was what I had struggled in a whole book to say. So I quickly asked my publisher if he could include a short quote from Wounds as the epigraph of the book, which he readily agreed to. So let me read you the epigraph. Are wars of aggression, wars for the conquest of colonies, just big business? Yes would seem so, however much the perpetrators of such national crimes seek to hide their purpose under banners of high-sounding abstractions and ideals. Today, the high-sounding abstractions and ideals are expressed in the claim that the West has a moral obligation to act, that we have a responsibility to protect, that we cannot stand idly by, and so on. The most insightful part of Bethune's essay, in my view, is the last paragraph. So he wrote, what do these enemies of the human race look like? And he's referring to those who, in the hunt for profit, start the wars which create the wounds that he's called upon to heal. Do they wear on their foreheads a sign so they may be told, so they may be shunned and condemned as criminals? No. On the contrary, they are the respectable ones. They are the pillars of the state, they are the pillars of the church, they are the pillars of society. They support private and public charity out of the excess of their wealth. They endow institutions. In their private lives, they are kind and considerate. But there's one sign by which these gentlemen can be told. Threaten a reduction in their profits, and the beast in them awakens with a snarl. They become ruthless as savages, brutal as madmen, ruthless as executioners. And when you read in the Wall Street Journal that Western oil companies had complained to the U.S. State Department that something had to be done about the Arab nationalist Gaddafi who threatened a reduction in their oil profits, it's hard not to think of the pillars of society and respectable people of whom Bethune wrote. Well, Bethune ended his essay with this. Such an organization of human society as permits them to exist must be abolished. And the overarching theme of this book is this. 
Washington's long war in Syria can only be understood within the context of the organization of human society as permits these enemies of humanity to exist. Thank you.